Welcome to the Politics of Everything. I'm Amber Danes, your host and podcast producer. This is a half hour of power, a podcast dropping every week where I unpack the politics of everything, from money to motherhood, nutrition to narcissism, startups to secularism, the environment, equality, and much, much more. Our guests are seasoned in the field or topic of their choice, even if you've not heard of them yet. This is a non-partisan show. So while I love exploring varied views and get a buzz from a healthy debate of ideas, this is not a purely blue, white, green program. Please subscribe, tune in and enjoy the politics of everything. A disaster brings out the best and at times the worst in everyday ordinary people. Rarely is it something less polarising. Thinking of devastating bushfires, major floods or terrorist attacks and the raw media images of what disaster looks like and the days that follow are pretty confronting for many people, let alone those experiencing the incident firsthand. My guest today is Alison Covington, the woman who brought Good360 charity to Australia. Good360, if you don't know it, is Australia's largest online marketplace, matching surplus brand new goods to people most in need. It offers the retail sector a sustainable community-focused option to redirect surplus product from landfill. In just six years, over 300 retailers and manufacturers have signed on and donated over $192 million worth of brand new product. These include essential toiletries, household items, clothing, shoes, PPE, and stationary supplies, to name a few areas. Their network of almost 3,000 member charities and disadvantaged schools Australia-wide across 31 cause areas order the goods they need from the Good360 website with the ease of 24-7 access, saving them time and obviously precious budget. Thanks to Alison's business model and vision, more than 22 million brand new items have been matched to people in need, helping to provide dignity and equality. Of this, due to -to back-to-back disasters over the last few years, including droughts, fires, bushfires and the ongoing devastation of the global pandemic that COVID-19 is, 9 million items have been matched directly to assist communities in disaster recovery. Good360 Australia is well on the way to achieving Alison's goal of matching $1 billion worth of brand new goods to Australians in need by 2025. And today we are discussing the politics of disaster recovery. Welcome, Alison. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So tell me about young Alison. Did you have childhood career ambitions? What were they and did you achieve them? Well, it definitely wasn't working in a charity. I just stumbled to work in a charity. What I wanted to do as a child was to be a pastry chef. So it's it's so different to where I ended oh, up. That's quite different. Um, when I was just- <laughs> Yeah, when I was at school, all I was really loved home economics and I wanted to be a pastry chef. And then my career advisor pointed out to me that pastry chefs started at four in the morning and I'm not good in the morning. So I had to have a very good think about a different career. So now I just save the cooking to the weekends in normal daylight hours. Well, that's a good thing. And so did you go on to university or did you do some sort of other training, um, I guess, prior to the career that you have now? Yeah, so I worked in a bank, so I did a graduate course in, I was working in banking, but then by accident, I moved into a bus industry. So I was doing banking and then into transport and I spent many of my years in transport. So I was buying and selling bus companies, which is a very unusual career. And then also trains. Very niche. Never heard of that before. (laughs) So everybody asked me, you know, what did you do previously? And I was managing director of public transport. So accidental careers I continue to have. And then I did get quite ill. So I spent a bit of time reassessing, you know, whether I wanted to go back into transport. So I had that sort of logistics background. And then I just stumbled across Good360. And I just couldn't not unknow it. And that's what I say to people is that, you know, once you know that there's all these spare goods rattling around in the world, and Good360 had been operating in the US for more than 30 years when I discovered it. And I sort of came back to the fact that, you know, I was a teenager when Good360 started in the US. And then I discovered it, you know, when I was in my, I think, 40s. And I just went, well, you know, all that time that I went on to have an education and a career, the US had a way of matching goods and they'd match $7 billion worth of goods by the time I stumbled across that concept. And I just couldn't unknow that in Australia we weren't matching these goods and that they were going to waste. But we had all these Australians who were desperately in need of brand new goods. And I just couldn't understand why we weren't matching that. 
And my mind just went to the fact that, you know, in my transport career, I knew how to move people from one place to another. I had that logistics background. Why wouldn't I just match the goods and move that to the people who knew it? And so then I stumbled into once you know something, you have to do something with that. Um, And I'm one of those types of people who just get things done. So I wasn't uniquely qualified to do it, but here I am 22 million items later having matched that. And I think, you know, what if I didn't? Yeah, no, it's an amazing achievement. And obviously there's a lot of need out there. So how is disaster recovery defined? And are there some common themes to show sort of how it's managed or how it eventuates for those of us who don't understand it? We often just see, I guess, those those raw media images, the, the tragedies, but we don't actually see what's going on on the ground. So can you give us a bit of an insight into that? Yeah, so what the media portrays is the actual disaster. And so, you know, we talk about disasters in six stages and there's the stage where you prepare for the disaster beforehand. So, you know, there's a lot of first responders who get, you know, the prepare kits ready prior to disasters. And then what we all really see in the media is the response stage where everybody's running in and and sorting out the response. Um, And that's where most of the attention is actually focused on is because you'll see the flood, the fire, the cyclone there. And that's where most of the money, energy and time goes to. But that's only you know a very small proportion of what a disaster actually is then you have the recovery stage is when you know you get into that cleanup stage you've got to get you know all the cleaning materials into those disasters to help on the immediate response and cleaning stage but then it goes much longer than that and that's often when the spotlight is actually turned away from the disaster and that's the rebuild stage and that you know if we look back to Australia's you know big bushfire disaster 18 months ago people are still only just getting to the stage of rebuilding they've been in temporary housing you know caravans tents and they're only now getting into their opportunity to rebuild and then we go on to refurnishing they now need the assistance that everybody was trying to give them 18 months ago sending them all the material goods back in response but they only now need that you know refurnish stage after they've rebuilt so that's sort of two years on And then they get back to being able to relive, you know, almost two to three years after that actual disaster. And that's when the spotlight has moved on because, you know, other disasters have taken all our attentions or the media's attentions and the general person's attention away from the disaster that someone's living with. And if you think about somebody who's been through the bushfires, you know, floods and mouse plagues and cyclones and COVID has hit, but somebody else is just still dealing with all the after effects of bushfires. Yeah, absolutely. It's a long cycle. And like you say, most of us, because we haven't had the spotlight put back on it, we sort of don't don't remember where those people are at and how long that will take for most of those communities. What makes a disaster recovery easier? I mean, we talk about things like charities and I guess services like what you provide. There's also government support. There's also good systems, I guess, insurance companies that are on board and so forth that people might be able to access as individuals. And also just that community spirit can also really help people or pitching in and helping their neighbours. What in your view is that perfect mix that makes that process, I guess, easier at probably the worst time in some people's lives? Yeah, I think it's good intentions, thinking about what your good intentions are and putting yourself in the the thoughts of the people who are in those disasters and so it's that collaborative approach so you know you often you have governments you have not-for-profits and then you have the general public understanding what's actually happening to the person who's going through that disaster and you know we often try to train people who are wanting to assist in these communities is you know your good intentions are they actually helpful and that's just being you know put it into the you know, mix of how that person's going through that. And it's the timing. So we have a saying, the right goods to the right people at the right time. And as we talk about those six stages, you know, we all rush out, you know, and it's natural because, you know, your heart goes out to somebody in that response stage. But just understanding is it the right time to assist and, and, you know, just making sure that you can do it over maybe a two-year cycle rather than all at that immediate response cycle and it's the collaboration between agencies just so that people get the assistance when they need them because you know as I said you know it's two years on and you know the mental anguish people are going through and just knowing that people still care two years on is very powerful is to know that people are still thinking about the disaster that somebody's in I think it's just really helpful to go you know we're still standing with communities because they know that you know the attention's on another disaster is just keeping the spotlight and standing with communities all the way through so I think having 
you know, a kit in place to say with these communities between government not-for-profits and communities, it's all still happening over a long life cycle. Absolutely. So disaster recoveries sometimes go wrong, I imagine. Is there any kind of ingredients that make that the case? Like is there sort of that commonality in why something might go wrong in those really crucial initial stages, but like you say, through that cycle, which might be two or three years along? Yeah, I think it's the fact that we all naturally will rush in in the response stage. So, you know, many charities are overwhelmed with the wrong goods arriving at the wrong time. And so they can't then respond to all these goods that people have generously donated. And, you know, there's a statistic that comes out is that 60% of goods donated in disasters go back to landfill because people just haven't thought through what they're donating. So it's that, you know, the wrong goods at the wrong time because it's our intention to do good, but sometimes we do more harm. And that can block up roads because, you know, all these trucks are turning up at the wrong time. So it's just thinking through the intention of the good that we're trying to do in communities and making sure we're doing no harm and that we're doing good and listening to the people who are actually there. Mm, absolutely particularly that landfill piece which is really kind of top of mind for lots of people these days you know where that where goods end up and like you say if they end up in landfill oh my goodness that's got creates its own disaster in itself I guess for the environment it does and you know that's the same for you know charities who have op shops you know people are donating things but they're not donating it with the right intentions they're just trying to do what they think is, you know, good for them rather than good for the end user. So it's, as I keep going back to, you know, what is your intention? Try to do no harm, but try to be making sure what you're donating is actually needed and listen to the people who are in those disasters to say, when do we need this? You know, people will be sending furniture or something and, you know, people don't have a house. So just make sure it's it's the right time in that disaster. Just listen and ask what's needed. And I think, you know, that's what we just keep saying. Yeah. Is there any practical ways to do that? Sorry to interrupt, but I'm just curious because I'm thinking I'm, I'm, I know what you're talking about, but that people just donating all this stuff and I guess businesses going, oh, we've got excess clothes or whatever. How do you actually manage that though? Is that something that your business might help with or is it yeah. other entities as well? Yeah, there are lots of charities. We're a matchmaker, so that's what we do. We match the right goods to the right people at the right time. And we have those conversations with businesses is about just staging the goods to make sure that they're there at the right time. And so, you know, businesses can pledge to donate that furniture and we just say to them, okay, we'll tell you when it's needed, but thank you. Now we know that we've got those furniture. We don't need it in the response stage, but of course we need it in the refurbished stage. And it's nice to know we've got that on hand. So we keep the records of the pledges and then we can go back to that community and go, okay, now we've got that furniture for you six months or 12 months down the track, but we won't send it to you when you're still needing mopping out and buckets. You know, we'll send you the buckets when you need it so it's all about just listening you know people want to do the right thing and so they immediately respond but you know we had this you know most crazy story where you know people send a truckload of nappies down to a, a community down the coast but they're all seniors living in that community there was no children and there was no babies oh my goodness um, you know so <laughs> it's just actually listening to what people want rather than doing what you think makes you feel good yeah, so absolutely. It, and that's what we are. We're just the matchmaker between the need and people's good intentions. And cuts out that waste and confusion, I guess, as well. Yeah, and it's just, you know, then all the people down there who receive them, you know, it just caused them more work to then try and relocate those goods and find somebody who actually needed them. Yeah, absolutely. So COVID-19, of course, has impacted everyone across the world and it's obviously changed perception of what a disaster is so often you know we think of things like a terrorist attack or mm -hmm. a major flood or a bushfire where it's you know quick and instant this is long and painful for many people and it has many stages and in many ways it's unprecedented territory for our whole generation what sort of steps are needed I guess from what you're you're doing in your business to get people's lives back on track I mean the disaster cycle is long but also we don't really know when it's going to really end and of course there's many unknowns about the virus strains and so forth how are you seeing your business kind of navigate that territory 
Yeah, and I think COVID is a little bit more hidden. You can see a bushfire, you can see a flood. It's a much more visual disaster, whereas what we see now is we have the new vulnerable. And the way I describe it is the people who are affected by COVID were the people who actually had $50 to donate to a bushfire. So they were the very generous Australians who were outpouring and giving $50 to Australians who needed it through these more visible disasters. Now we have the hidden Australians who are vulnerable. These are people who have been stood down, they don't have work, they've been asked not to work. And so, you know, they're Australians who have never seen or asked for charity before. These are our most generous Australians who are always the ones giving. So this is a hidden disaster that people don't know how to ask for charity. They don't know how to ask for help and they're silently suffering. So this has to be a disaster where you help people with dignity, stand with them and lift them up. And so, you know, we work with brand new goods and we work with businesses who generally had excess goods, but now they're giving goods in challenging times. So, you know, our businesses are also doing it very tough themselves. We know retailers are having a really tough time, but they're reaching in to say, how do we lift up Australians who don't know how to ask for help? And that's what, you know, this is a really silent disaster that we've got people who will have mental health issues, you know, who, you know, have children at home and things like that. And, you know, we've been asked to homeschool our children, but people don't have the the way to do that and it's very hard to do things that have been asked of us if we don't have the goods to do that absolutely so our role um the 360s role is to lift up society and give them access to things in a very dignified way and we do that through you know very local grassroots charities not-for-profits and schools to sort of say that you know if you can just have these conversations in your communities in your neighborhoods and make sure people around you have what they need to go from surviving to thriving And it's just even as simple as being saying face masks are mandatory. Um, What if you're struggling to put food on your table? You know, how do you afford to have a face mask? So, you know, we just give communities access to the things that they need to be able to survive. Absolutely. So in terms of leaders, how do you think they can become better at this disaster recovery process, say in in a business or in their own communities? I guess there's that localised, you know, your friends and neighbours can, can help you out. But when you are when you are a leader in an organisation, I imagine it takes more than just resilience to navigate this. Can you share any sort of experiences or some examples perhaps of what you've learned from other leaders in this particular space? Yeah, it's really tough because every business is doing it tough and every business is learning. You know, as you said, it's that word that we all, you know, hate saying, but it is unprecedented. People are just trying to figure out how to navigate this. We've worked with some fantastic businesses and, you know, they are doing it tough themselves, but they're trying. What we hear is a common thread is that they want to do the right thing. So they're looking at how to support their employees and their local communities. And they're just stepping up to say, you know, what else can we do that helps our employees feel good about how they're supporting their local communities and I think it's that internal cultural fit to say that you know we want to do the right thing because you know we are a business that operates in our own communities and even these are businesses that are national but they have a local footprint because they might have 180 stores around the country so even if they're national they're still local because their employees work and live in local communities. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's that cultural fit to say, you know, it's very Australian, it's very mateship, but it's about, you know, how do we do the right thing? Because if we all survive, then we all thrive. And I think that's what we've seen, what I think I respect most of the leaders in these organisation, organisations is the fact that they want everyone to thrive and they're looking after their employees and their local communities and they've partnered with us just to keep, helping Australians in challenging times. So turning the spotlight onto yourself, I always believe people have got to where they are because they've had other people helping them or inspiring them along the way. Who have been your greatest mentors? It can be one or two. And why have they made such an impact in your life? I would say it was my dad. He died when I was 13, but he did say to me when I was 13, you live in a time where you can be and do anything that you want. And I think, you know, it's that sort of mindset that he gave to me when I was quite young. And it was, you know, one of the last few things that I remember him saying to me that just made me believe that I could do that. And I think, you know, for young girls to have a father who always raised me to be like that, and I had a brother as well, so we were treated equally. It wasn't, you know, one rule for the daughter and one rule for the son, but it was just the mindset of saying that you can live in a place and do anything that you want to achieve. 
made me just realize that I could because I think, you know, daughters or little girls believe anything that their dad's saying. Yeah, that's great. Um, and then I went on to always do that. But, yeah, yes. and then also too I didn't realise it, but people say it all the time, you marry somebody like your father. And so then my husband has also had that same sort of mentality or, or maybe I just made sure I married somebody who had the same mentality that I could always do anything that I wanted. And then I sort of attracted to people around me that, you know, we always just get out there and do anything that we want to do because, you know, living in a lucky country like Australia, we can, if you have that mindset, you can have a go. And then I've got two boys myself or young men and they've only ever seen a relationship where we are equal and that we have that type of relationship that we can just do anything and we back each other to do anything. But I think that comes from having a childhood where, we were allowed to believe that we could do anything and backed to get out there and have a go. And I think that's the sort of people that I surround myself with. But I also then encourage my team or my friends and my family to do the same. And I think that's having those mentors around you, but also mentoring other people to believe the same. And I'm, you know, often, you know, telling people, of course you can do that. Why do you think you can't do that? And I think that just comes from the childhood. Yeah, self-limiting beliefs can often really rule our headspace, yeah. I think, in, in and, our lives more yeah, than we realise. You know, I constantly have raised my kids like that and, you know, my team to be like that. And I just look at them when, and I look at anybody who doesn't believe in themselves and I'm just I have this wonderment about why don't you believe in yourself? Because I think, you know, we have to mentor more people just to get, anything out of their head that doesn't believe in that because you know if I didn't believe that I could match these goods so many people would be you know going without but I wasn't uniquely qualified to do that it was just that I thought well if I don't who's going to so I think more people just have to get that out of their head and just go on and believe. Absolutely if you could choose a favorite book song or film what would it be and why? Um, it's probably a little bit corny. I'm probably almost embarrassed to say. But I'll go actually, and do it. <laughs> it's actually Love Actually. And I think it's because I always have so many tabs open in my head. And that movie is so many different stories going on all at once that combine. And I think I always say to everyone, I've got so much crazy going on in my head, but it all works and they all combine and it all makes sense to me. And I think that's when I look at that movie, I just think it's the same. <laughs> it's just all this crazy going on, but it all comes together. And it's just one of those feel good movies that I love watching every year. And it just makes me smile. And I think, you know, we just have to have something in life that just, you know, probably is a bit silly, but it does make us smile and it just makes us happy. Absolutely. So as we wrap up today, what would be your final takeaway message for us on the politics of disaster recovery? I think, you know, just, you know, be prepared to help in disasters. I think, you know, we want to always be the type of people and the type of country that get in there and help each other. But just be mindful, like, you know, our good intentions have to actually help the people who need it, but think and listen. And that's what I always just ask is just listen to what somebody needs and ask the question. Don't be afraid to ask what somebody needs and don't let our own good intentions get in the way of what people actually need. And, and that's what Absolutely. we're all about is just asking and listening. Yeah. You've given us some fantastic ideas on how we can be a bigger part of what your business does and also, of course, be great citizens, I guess, of the world. Um, if you do want to connect further with Alison, there will be just some details on the show notes as always. Until next time, take care. Thanks so much for listening today. If you've enjoyed the politics of everything, I thrive on your feedback. So please add a short review and share the podcast with your network through Apple, Spotify and all the usual suspects. I'm always on the hunt for new and diverse guests. So if you or someone you know has a fresh idea you're busting to get out there, please email me at amber at amberdanes.com and my crew will get back to you very soon.